Good morning, British and American culture students. <clears throat> we successfully did the fifth quiz, but as usual, uh, there were some issues, unfortunately. So let's address the first one. Um, I did some editing to the quiz last night and mistakenly put in some questions from Tuesday's lecture, which I specifically said I would not. Now, this affected everybody equally, but it's not really fair because a few students may have watched the second lecture and um, absorbed more of it, the one on Tuesday, I mean, about the American Civil War. So um, again, <clears throat> we'll have to figure this out, be flexible about this. There were two questions which were answered, uh, had the lowest correct responses, okay? And they were both related to the lecture that I said was not gonna be on it. The question was, what was the sticking point that caused the Southern states to secede from the Union? I added that question in last night. Um, and the other one was, what was Gen General Tecumseh Sherman's famous quote about the American Civil War? Um, it, it's glory is only moonshine. Both of those were specific major points in the lecture on Tuesday, which had you realized uh, you were supposed to know that material, you probably would have, uh, more people would have gotten them right. 12 people out of 55 got that right. 16 out of 55 got the um, Southern States seceding question right. All the other questions were between 20 and uh, 35. Uh, one question had 40 correct answers. So there's two questions um, that people had trouble with and the median is five, which is low. So this is what I'm going to do. The, the same thing that all the biology teachers and all the engineering teachers do uh, when too many students don't understand a formula or that the professor makes a question too hard on a test. They curve the grade up. So everybody is gonna get, um, the, the curve is gonna be pushed up by two, okay? So everybody's score is gonna go up by two. Um, I know the people who got 10, there were three people who got 10, are gonna grumble grumble because they got 10, but it's still not fair. So like it or lump it, that's the way it is. One person got nine, zero people got eight. So there was only four students who happened to absorb the information um, from the new, uh, from the extra lecture uh, by happenstance or by just being very studious, I don't know. But this is what we're going to do because the major majority of you had your grades pushed down by two points. So I'm going to curve, curve the scores up. So when I release your score, if you got 10, you got 10. If you got 9, you got 10. Okay? So there's four people that got 10 on the score on this, on this midterm. Everybody else, add 2. Okay? I'm not going to change the score. It takes too long. To change it on Google Google Forms, but on my um, on my Excel spreadsheet, I'm just going to add two to everybody's score, and it'll be capped at ten. So you can't get two bonus points. Um, but if you got ten, good for you. So um, anybody who got seven, got, <clears throat> anybody who got seven got nine. Anybody who got six got eight, and so on down to one person only got one. That person now has three. <clears throat> okay, problem solved. I apologize for that. I was just trying to make the quiz a little bit um, better and more diverse. And I mistakenly added stuff from the lecture I had just done because I, I, I actually <clears throat> enjoyed teaching that lecture. So I guess it was on my mind. Uh, one more thing. <clears throat> uh, I've gotten emails from several students about server lag. Uh, when you go in at 10 o'clock, the quiz doesn't show up right away. It happened on quiz number four for the first time that I heard of. I was checking it on quiz number four um, because you know the midterm kind of got messed up because I had to make a new midterm so I was checking and uh, it didn't load right away for me and I think it was um, the internet on Chungnam. I don't know uh, if it was the the cyber campus server or it was my computer or whatever but when I refreshed it, <clears throat> I was able to go into the form. So I, I was able to access it like 10.01 or 10.02. A couple students said that happened to them today. A couple students said that last time. 
there's not really anything I can do about that. Um, just refresh it. Just like, you know, when you try to log in for a BTS ticket and you can't log in because there's too many people logging in or the server's not working, just refresh it and it should work, okay? I can't really, if it doesn't work, I can't really give you an excuse or give you extra time. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about that. I wish I could make sure the internet worked perfectly, but I can't. Um, so just, if it doesn't initially work, just refresh and I, within a minute it should work. Um, it's, it's there, waiting. It just didn't, didn't pop up right away. I don't know why it, it happened to me once on quiz number four. This week was, there was no problem. Um, so I don't know what happened with other students, but um, maybe, maybe I'll move the timer up to 9.59 uh, to make sure that there, if there's one minute of lag, that's not a problem. I don't know. I'll try and figure something out. But I know, I, I heard your complaints and I understand how you feel. There's not very much I can do as usual, but I'll try and figure out something like perhaps starting the quiz one minute early um, so that maybe if it lags, that won't, that won't affect your 10 minutes of time, okay? Anyway, today we're, we're gonna talk about the American frontier. Uh, the idea of a frontier is very important in American culture because um, it, en it enabled them to so sort of focus on their own business in a strange way, to expand like an imperial, you know, uh, dominating power, but within a territory that they already considered open. They were conquering native lands that did not belong to them, but they looked at it as if it was available, that it wasn't occupied. This is another contradiction, right? We're not an empire. We're not dominating other, uh, other people because native people don't count as people. This is basically the philosophy. It comes back to this idea of manifest destiny. <clears throat> All of these things that we've been talking about, and this is part of the reason why the quizzes get a little bit entangled with each other, because we've been talking about slavery and that, and 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 human rights, and, um, and we've been talking about imperialism for lecture after lecture, because these things don't go away, right? Manifest destiny is a is a <clears throat> sort of religious belief that you are the chosen people, <clears throat> and there's something important that you have to do right at the beginning of this part of the semester, right after the midterm, I had this list, right, of five American ideals. And one of those things is the idea that Americans think they are special, okay? This is just a general core idea. It manifests itself. It, it shows itself in many different ways. It shows itself in um, American pride and arrogance. It shows them itself in their, their, their um, belief, their confidence, right? It shows them in their success and, and, their, and how courageous they are and how they, they believe that they can do anything. There's good things and bad things about this attitude, um, but it, it sort of has its origin in, you know, the Spanish Armada and the Protestant wind smashing the Spanish ships. And uh, again, the Protestant wind blowing James II's fleet you know, keeping them in the harbor so that um, William William the Third can can bring his fleet from the Netherlands and um, he can he can uh, peacefully uh, basically take over the government and dethrone his uncle and and begin the glorious revolution. So those two those two Protestant wins there are commemorated in 1588 and 1688. And then <clears throat> when the pilgrims, uh, those people we call the pilgrims that go across in the Mayflower on those ships to, to start the Plymouth colony, and they're, they're heading somewhere towards South Carolina, North Carolina area, um, towards the Chesapeake in Virginia, and the wind blows them um, up towards Massachusetts and Boston, um, they, see, they perceive that as God's will, right? And this, this again, this <clears throat> becomes part of an American expansion attitude, is that it's God's will that we, our country, expand from 
all the way to the Pacific Ocean from one sea to the other. And Canada too um, has the same, it's, it's not based on this, but we, we had this same sense that we needed to unify <clears throat> the continent. And uh, uh, once the Americans started doing it, we felt that we needed to do the same thing. That's why the, the, um, at the bottom of the coat of arms of Canada, it says mare ad marum, uh, which means from sea to sea in Latin. Uh, mare ad mare. <clears throat> and um, so this from sea to sea idea means that throughout the 19th century, which we've been talking about um, with the exception of basically the Civil War where they're, they're focusing on each other, uh, they are continuously trying to expand. So there's, there's, there's multiple great expansions, right? There's after the, after 1776 and 1783, the Revolutionary War, it moves into the beginning of the 19th century and the Jeffersonian era, era when the British are gone and then uh, American expansion moves over the mountains and into uh, the interior, right? Towards the Mississippi, right? So this is the first expansion, is the early 18th century, the 1800s, the, in, we can just say this is the Jeffersonian era. Thomas Jefferson is the president and he believes in um, the, the farmer as the base, the independent farmer as the basic unit of the Republic. And in this period, they expand south and they, re, they push the natives west. Um, one of the most tragic events happens during Andrew Jackson's uh, uh, presidency where the Cherokee people who have basically attempted to uh, become American and be assimilated into American culture by um, having their own newspaper and making a written language and uh, you know um, trading and, and, and establishing villages among the Americans um, are removed by by Andrew Jackson's government. Even though the state of Georgia and the Justice Department say it's illegal to move them, they forcibly, it's one of the, one of the many, many um, crimes against humanity that are committed by, uh, I, and I can't name them all, there are so many, but this is one of the, the big ones. It's called the Trail of Tears. And that was not Thomas Jefferson that did that, but the Cherokee tribe were marched across um, thousands of kilometers across the Mississippi uh, towards, you know, um, the Western Territory, the Oregon Territory, where they never lived before. And, and uh, this was in the winter and hundreds of them died and they, they, their villages were destroyed and they got lost all of their, their belongings and just had to migrate with nothing. Um, it's, it's a crime against humanity. That's what it is. There's nothing. There's no other way of describing that. It's just the same thing as um, dropping bombs on people's houses and, you know, um, them refugees in Syria running to other countries or other areas of their country because their entire lives are destroyed. They did this on purpose, forcibly removed them. So all of this territory um, <clears throat> east of the Mississippi, um, most of the native people get <clears throat> forcibly removed. Then Florida um, becomes incorporated into the United States. And then the Louisiana Purchase, one of the biggest purchases of land in the history of the world, happens where uh, the area which was belonged to France, including New Orleans, New er New, uh, <clears throat> Nouvelle Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. <clears throat> I don't know how to say it properly. I, I haven't spoken French in so long. Um, Orléans, anyway, <clears throat> it's New Orleans, Orle Orléans is in France. So it's named after, uh, and Louisiana is named after King Louis XIV. Napoleon sells it to them because they need money. Jefferson is happy to buy it. So <clears throat> they take Georgia, they remove all the native people, they buy the French land, they have all the way to the Mississippi now, and then they start encountering Mexicans. Because uh, if you look at a map now, Mexico is big, but it's much smaller than it used to be. Um, all of those border states down there, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, um, Las Vegas, California, all of those parts were part of Northern Mexico. And I'm not gonna talk about that 
too much, except for the fact that all of those states, through the um, <clears throat> through the Mexican American War, become part of the United States too. So it's expanded south and west and southwest all the way to California after this. In the Mexican-American War, there is a, a very famous person named Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett is a legend because <clears throat> uh, he was a woodsman, he was a hunter, he was a politician, you know, he was a tough man, an honest man, and he was seen as a, like a sort of ideal American type uh, individual. And he was there when the Mexicans attacked a place called the Alamo, where, <clears throat> despite the fact, sorry, I have a cold, I need that ginger tea. Um, despite the fact that the Americans were um, outnumbered, hundreds by hundreds, I think there was only 75 or 80 Americans, they, they held out there for days, for more than a week, um, fighting against nearly a thousand Mexican soldiers. And they, they, they kept them back. <clears throat> and then uh, eventually they were overwhelmed and the Mexican soldiers killed all of them. So it was a massacre. They didn't take any prisoners, probably because they were so angry that uh, many of them died when they sh the, um, the Americans should have surrendered. They were going to lose eventually. It was a thousand, you know, it was, a, it was 10 to 1. They couldn't win, but they refused to give up. So they fought them until um, the last man, and they killed every one of them. And so the this was called a massacre in Texas in America. And this this uh, atrocity, this um, cruel act <clears throat> of not taking any prisoners and killing them all, actually ignited the patriotism of the Americans, and probably was one of the factors that enabled the Americans to raise enough. Um, support and and uh, bodies and and soldiers to um, defeat the Mexicans. So through a series of battles and in sorry in the Alamo, Davy Crockett, it's in the textbook in the Alamo. Davy Crockett dies. He's one of them who sacrifices himself for the defense of Texas and the defense of of United States. Now let me say, um, a Mexican person will tell you that. You know, that land was Mexican and the Texans, it didn't belong to them. There was a Texas revolution and there were some Mexicans that were Tejanos and they wanted to leave Mexico too. Mexico was a very unstable country, let's say at the time. Um, so they wanted to, to be independent. They wanted to make their own country. But then when Mexico tried to uh, reabsorb the Texas state, which was briefly a country, any Texan will tell you, well, we were a country. Um, the Texans are very proud of themselves, um, but after the Texas Revolution, they were briefly independent, and then uh, Mexico and the United States fought against the, uh, each other for control of Texas, and Texas was absorbed by the United States rather than by Mexico by choice. Um, but anyway, there are those those people, those Mexican people who lived there before the white Texans. You know, those are Tejanos. Those are the original Hispanic uh, Texans. Uh, some of them are part native, of course. Mexicans have a lot more native blood in them uh, than the typical North American, uh, American European does. So anyway, not to get too deep into uh, the Mexican-American War, but um, the Mexicans took the offensive, lost some important battles. Uh, the Americans advanced and eventually went all the way to Mexico City. Uh, and and basically conquered Mexico and forced them to give up the territories they took, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Las Vegas, and California. That's why Southern California has so many Spanish names and Southern Texas and Arizona has so many Spanish names because there were Spanish people there first before there were um, Anglo-Europeans and, and, and French people and other people from other areas. So that's Davy Crockett. That's the Texas uh, Mexican American War. And as I mentioned in the last lecture, in 1865, there was the Alaska Purchase, 
which completed this ac massive acquisition of territory, which looks like, if you're a Korean, this, is, this amount of territory is about uh, 50 times bigger than Korea. So you'd have enough land to last you forever, but not so if you're American. So there's this huge territory still in the Northwest, as I said. There's a Northwest and it's still up there. And, and uh, <clears throat> in the slides, I know you probably haven't thought about the slides for a while, but in the slides, there's a really good picture of Manifest Destiny. There's a painting and there's this ghostly woman floating over the plains. And behind her is our trains and horses and factories and cities and uh, wagons. And in front of her are animals and native people on horses and, and burning teepees uh, and fleeing in front of her. And she's the figure, the ghostly figure of Manifest Destiny. And that's um, what, that is the, the, the driving idea is that this land belongs to us and it, it's for us, it's not being developed. It's supposed to be developed. This is something that, it's another one of those imperial justifications really is this land isn't being used properly. So we're going to, we're going to develop it and use it. As you know, we are now suffering the consequences of this idea that we would develop all areas of natural beauty and, and take its resources without thinking about the consequences to the environment, right? This is the legacy of colonialism, imperialism, industrialism, that we are living in a world that is being destroyed by pollution. Um, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but this is why we study these things, right? That the native people were living in harmony with, the, with nature and there was a, you know, a healthy um, reciprocation. But once um, the Europeans and Americans got a hold of all those resources, they started cutting down all the trees, digging holes in the ground, taking oil, um, building train tracks, putting houses on top, diverting ri rivers, putting pollution in the air, driving livestock everywhere and destroying all of the land, right? Using it, but not really <laughs> leaving it intact. And if you, if you uh, spread all of this, you know, development all over the place, then you actually start damaging your own health. As we can see, it's becoming more and more apparent. So <clears throat> let's go back to the textbook for a second. Um, there's also Paul Bunyan, and I would like you to read about Paul Bunyan yourself. Paul Bunyan is a, is a tall tale. He's sort of the opposition. Davy Crockett is a real hero. Paul Bunyan is a tall tale. He's a fictitious hero, right? He's a myth. Just like we had at the beginning of the class, we had Alfred, who is a, the real, Alfred the Great was a real Anglo-Saxon king. And here we have Paul Bunyan and David Crockett. David Crockett was a real frontiersman, a real hunter, politician, um, you know, um, hunter, uh, skilled outdoorsman, and, uh, you know, a man of strong character, of good character. Um, just like Alfred was an ideal king and King Arthur was a fictitious ideal king hero. Paul Bunyan was the same. He was a woodcutter and he was an outdoorsman and he was a giant and he had sort of uh, exceptional abilities because he was so big and strong. He could do all these things and he traveled around and he changed the landscape. All kinds of interesting uh, things that explained, you know, the landscape of, of the United States. And the reason why we have these myths is so that you can tell these stories to whatever American kid, whatever part of America they're from, whatever country their parents are from or what they look like, they can all say, ah, yes, Paul Bunyan was the one who, who made the Grand Canyon and he's the one who sat down over there and made this big crater and um, um, he made the Great Plains by chopping down all the trees and him and, him and his, uh, his blue ox stamped across here and made the mud flats, all that kind of stuff. Um, so those are the, that's the contrast between myth and uh, real live um, legacy there. And then there's the, the pages about the American Civil War, which we already covered. As I said, we're jumping back and forth in this chapter a little bit, but you need to read through the whole chapter. 
Um, one of the most significant events there was in the 19th century for westward expansion was the California Gold Rush. Now the California Gold Rush happened right after. <clears throat> it happened right after the Mexican-American War ended <clears throat> and right after Unfortunately, the Mexicans agreed to cede um, through the treaty, peace treaty, that uh, the Americans took control of California. Not like one year later, it was um, 1849. Uh, it, it's an easy number to remember because my favorite, my favorite uh, football team is the San Francisco 49ers. They are named the 49ers because in 49, people discovered before 49, uh, gold was discovered, but in 49, the rumor that there was gold in the mountains in California spread like wildfire. And all of these people um, dropped everything what they were doing. Um, poor people, criminals, um, <clears throat> educated people, uh, rich people, bankers, lawyers, they all dropped what they were doing and got bought some tools some mining tools got some equipment and thousands of them moved to california to try and win the lottery by um, panning for gold and digging for gold in the mountains with the freezing cold and uh, the dangerous thieves uh, the natives and um, bears and all that kind of stuff lots of people died and um, as you can imagine most there were women that went but most of the women were not super excited about freezing to death alone in in the mountains with wild animals and dangerous people to find gold. Um, so the population was very largely done. There was that San Francisco was uh, dominated by men. There, most of the women were in the in the in the city providing services of various kinds. You can imagine there would be different kinds of services there for men if there was a lot of them. Some of them um, running hotels and restaurants and providing, selling things and other, you know, there was prostitution, of course, um, there as well. And um, so there was a real unbalance at first when it was just um, uh, gold miners, gold prospectors and gold miners going there. But it caused a huge movement, influx of people of different types, even people, the Asian people and African people and Mexican people, it attracted people from all over the place. So you ended up with a very like mixed um, group of people, mostly male, um, looking for gold. And it, so this huge um, influx of natives, Spanish, Asians, um, everybody mixing in California created sort of a new society. And then they, you know, there was, um, it started to evolve into the California slowly it started to involve like I mean um, the weather in California is amazing uh, at first it was just about the gold but then they discovered there's you know they formed all these enclaves and and towns and cities and they grew and there was these beautiful beaches and great weather uh, and it and from there um, California started to um, increase its population and its influence um, <clears throat> So for many, you know, the East is already crowded, it's already developed, and there's less opportunities over there. So this westward expansion, go west, becomes, becomes a dream. It becomes part of the American dream. You land in New York and you find New York is full of slums and, and it's harder than you thought. Like you left a dirty big city and a hard life in Europe and you came all the, or somewhere else in a maybe Maybe you came from, uh, maybe you came from Asia. Most people came from Europe, but maybe you came from Africa or, or Asia or, or even South America. But you arrive in New York City uh, to in seal, you know, the Statue of Liberty and everything. And what do you find? You find a big dirty city where it's, um, seg you know, it's very hard to make your own living. So, you know, people are getting pushed out. New people are getting pushed out. Um, people who, who want new opportunities are looking for land and looking for ways that they can um, develop themselves and 
live the American dream. So, you know, they go west and the land out there isn't as attractive. Uh, it's flat, it's really dry, there's tornadoes, there's clouds of insects, there's floods and, and um, it's very far away from anybody else. There's no trees, there's no mountains, it's just flat forever. It's a pretty difficult um, life, but nonetheless, um, the railroads start moving across and that's a huge thing. The railroads provide the life, the lifeline, connecting the resources of the interior to the industrial power of the north and the, and the economic power of the north. And so through all these connect, transportation connections, which we can call the transportation revolution, um, originally it's canals and movement by water, but then they develop the, the trains and they move all of this equipment and wood and supplies out into the plains and they dig and they grow food and they transport everything back and this economic system starts to gain steam and develop. Um, there is, of course, um, conflict, constant conflict between American settlers and native people who are supposed to be on this land and it's supposed, it's supposed to be their territory. It's supposed to be reservations, the territory is supposed to be open and there's several very, very serious encounters. There's massacres and there's battles. One of the most famous is um, um, the Battle at Little Bighorn. The American military, <clears throat> um, Colonel Custer um, gets killed along with hundreds of other American soldiers um, in the Black Hills because they found gold in, in the Dakotas. Um, but gradually the natives are it's small in number, they're dependent for weapons on uh, American trade. Uh, they can't make their own guns or, or their own bullets or fix their own weapons. So um, they're, they're fighting a lost cause and um, they are, are continuously pushed back. And whenever they resist, the American military comes in and forcibly um, engages them and puts them on reservations or kills them. Um, another group of people that is out that in the frontier in, in, the, in the West um, that people know very well because of movies are cowboys. Now, <clears throat> cowboys have gotten a really weird, false um, image for two reasons. Um, when they were, at the time, there were cowboys, um, there was some contemporary writing about what cowboys looked like and, and what kind of people they were. And there was an American writer who, who saw them and um, he described them as the the most amoral, disgusting, dirty, lewd, uneducated, um, filthy uh, people he'd ever met. He said, they, they're all criminals. They've all, they've all been criminals in the East and then they've run away from their murderers, former murderers and thieves and, and rapists. And they've run away and then they've um, escaped from their crimes or prisoner, prison senses and they've become cowboys and they escort these these uh, cows throughout the interior and then when it's time to bring them to the market in the north um, you see them come to they spend months and months on the out in the hills in the the ranches following these these um, animals and sleeping on the ground and shooting guns at each other and then when it's time to sell these beasts then they they ride into town and then um, go to all the bars and get drunk and spend their money and harass everybody and cause trouble. Okay, <clears throat> that's what that guy saw. And I guess that's kind of like saying, you know, in the past, sailors are, you, you, you don't want to, you don't want to date a sailor or you, you want to stay, you don't want to get in a fight with a sailor because, you know, the, the English sailors would be at sea for six months and they wouldn't have had any um, fun. They wouldn't have had any. Much, they would probably drink because that was something that you were allowed to do. They they brought alcohol on the ship, but not enough to drink. They would have been rationing alcohol. So now they can get into port, 
They can try and find some women. They can try and find some men. They can try and, you know, looking for sex or looking for fights, looking for other people, looking to get as much alcohol in them as can. And they're just, that's just like a, a there's nothing, nothing worse than a, a sailor who's just been at sea for six months because he's just a wild animal. I guess the, the and you know, that stereotype is old. I'm talking about hundreds of years ago, but um, cowboys had the same reputation. They were sleeping on the ground uh, with a bunch of cows for six months. And when they came into town, they were ready to party and go crazy. Uh, that's what they did. And they did have guns and they, they were dirty and stinky and, and probably um, offensive and maybe uneducated, but they weren't all criminals and they weren't all ugly pigs. Um, the, he was obviously exaggerating when he said they were scumbags and they were the, the worst person in the world. If they were, they wouldn't have done their jobs, I think. The sailors too. Were the British sailors the worst people? No, of course not. Admiral Nelson was a sailor. There were some outstanding sailors. Whether they got drunk and had parties and did bad things sometimes, I don't know. But, you know, there was a lot of uh, very capable, upright, um, hardworking, not filthy dogs uh, working in the British Navy. And the Cowboys, the same thing can be said. On the other hand, Admiral Nelson is a, an exception. He's an ideal type. Not everybody in the British Navy was had his every button in, in a straight line and his brass straightened out and his boots shined and standing at attention on the deck that was, you know, had been had been mopped five seconds before, so it was shining. That's a George Washington type look too. Everything's looking very sharp and shiny and, and presentable. That's what George Washington was like. Uh, Ad Admiral Nelson, cowboys, no. Regular sailors, no. They were dirty, di dirty and disgusting. And you know what pirates look like. They usually have black teeth and one eye and a missing ear and one hand. Um, it's certainly true that, that, that uh, a cowboy would look rough, especially if he hadn't had a bath in six months. But what you get on, on the Hollywood version, um, when you see John Wayne, for example, is like a rugged, handsome, you know, Marlboro man. Like an ideal, he's in perfect shape. He, he, if, he took his, if he took his shirt off, he could be an underwear model. He's, he's a muscular, strong, um, <laughs> rugged um, <laughs> piece, piece of, uh, of modeling material, right? And, and um, everything's done, everything's done. He's like a, some kind of Spartan warrior, um, some idealized type. That, that's very far from the truth too. That's just something Hollywood created some sort of romantic, ideal, um, masculine symbol, hyper-masculine symbol for, for the audiences to enjoy. So the cowboys were neither one nor the other, but closer to the filthy, you know, out of control, um, you know, drunk, um, rough and tumble cowboys that uh, took their cows to, to Chicago than anything else. So these are not the original Americans though. Cowboys are not the original Americans. And of course there were, contrary to Hollywood's portrayals, there were also African-American and Mexican cowboys. They were not all white. And the, the ones that were heroic or not had nothing to do with what they looked like either. So we've talked about native people already. <clears throat> I've mentioned them quite a few times. In this section, um, I go into, you, you have to read uh, this over a little bit about the original Americans. It'll give you some background, which we've already talked about. When did they come? Um, you know, how they got encountered. There's some comparison, right? There's some comparison between different cultures uh, that we talked about, uh, the British and um, the North American, and uh, the tragedy of the loss of up to 95% of those people. <clears throat> some terrible, some terrible um, accidents, there's some terrible massacres, there's some deliberate, um, there's some, some deliberate attempts to reduce the population of, uh, of the natives as well. So I've chosen, I've just, I wouldn't even say the representative, that's maybe the wrong word. Uh, I've chosen some 
tribes that are famous and are different from each other. I'm just trying to show some diversity. And unfortunately, some of these tribes are famous because they're the ones who were involved in certain events uh, that were are remembered historically. And that's why I know more about them and I feel comfortable saying something about them. But there are the Iroquois, the Arawaks, the Algonquin, sorry, there's a, let me, let me shut my window. At the beginning of Corona, I had a student say, I can't hear your lecture because there's a helicopter outside. Um, I don't control the helicopters. Sorry. <clears throat> so we'll just wait for a second while that jet engine goes by. So you're not allowed to complain about helicopters or, or jet engines. You can talk about other things that complain about things I can control. Uh, as I was saying, there are several tribes at the end of this chapter, starting at 207. Make sure you read the whole part though. Read from the original Americans, 203, read to the end of the chapter. The end of the chapter um, ends with the, the guilt, um, and I'm gonna talk about that later because um, there is something you know personal and um, related to Canadian culture that I think I have to mention. Um, uh, it's my responsibility to bring uh, it to your attention, but I'll bring it to your attention later. Um, this is mostly about how Americans treat natives, but let's not exclude um, Canada from the guilt that needs to be addressed in uh, how native people were treated and why we have lost such a so many people and how the culture and the languages and way of life and uh, people that we've lost are irreplaceable. So let's do as much as we can to, to uh, support and give back to them uh, the things that they need for their cultures to survive. Read about the original Americans, the Arawaks, the Iroquois, the Algonquin, the Sioux, and the Apache. There's five different uh, famous tribes or groups of tribes which give you a sense of the, just a basic sense of the variety of native people, but that's not even close. That's just touching the surface. It's like saying, okay, here is uh, <clears throat> Asia, Korea, Japan, China, Mongolia, Vietnam. Now you know Asia. That's ridiculous. But Nonetheless, we don't have enough time to talk about all of the other countries, like some of the most important ones like India, Russia, Pakistan, uh, Iran. If I left any countries out, I apologize. Uzbekistan, Bangladesh. I know some of you are from different Asian countries. Now you know what I mean. If I say these certain, I'm not trying to emphasize them as more important. I'm just trying to give you a sample of a few different tribes for you to get the idea of how diverse North America was, just like Asia or Europe or Africa. But now it's been flattened, right? Now we look at native people as native people, but there's as many native people, it's still in existence, they're just small groups. There, there were hundreds of people, just like India, okay? They've all been collapsed into one group of people. And China too. I mean, China has sort of had this cultural project of unification, but China could be split still into many, many different groups of people. Even my Chinese friends, they're like, you know, they all speak the same language and they're all Chinese, but they're all from different areas and they speak Chinese differently and they have different personalities and different environments um, and they identify as Chinese. That's cool, but we got to recognize that there are differences between them. Uh, so keep reading until the end of the chapter. And at the very, on 216, there's a great, I know the map's kind of gray and you have to look close at it, but those are the names of all the major and minor tribes um, that we know of. And you can see there's a couple hundred there. And that's, that's what America originally was. And now we'll finish chapter six right there. Um, we're going to have... We're gonna do, again, three lectures and then a <clears throat> uh, quiz. So I <clears throat> am planning on having that quiz. I think I put it up, quiz number six. I think I posted when it would be. 
Um, if I haven't, I will. And uh, the quiz will be in two weeks again. Um, I think we have a problem though. December 10th is a makeup day for some people, if I'm not mistaken. Where? Uh, hold on a second. Oh, I have to log in again. Okay, <clears throat> I'll look at it later. I'll post, um, I have to look at the schedule exactly. Our exam, our exam is gonna be on Tuesday, December 14th. We have one more quiz. It's going to be, it's not gonna be next week though. It'll be uh, either the Tuesday or the Friday, two weeks from now. So you gotta finish your response, of course. Second contradiction paper. Finish your contradiction paper. Exams on December 14th, and I'll make sure I figure out what day we can do the quiz. We gotta make sure that doesn't conflict uh, with some sort of makeup day. But I think, I, I think December 10th is our makeup day. So we should be okay to do the quiz on that day. Can't find my... No, okay, it's not our makeup day. Hmm. Okay, so our exam is going to be on December 14th. Then since the, it looks like the 10th is designated as a Monday, so we can't use that day because some of you might have class. So we're gonna have to do quiz number six. Quiz number six is gonna have to be on the seventh, okay? Because that's gonna be, uh, that won't, that'll be our day. So quiz number six is gonna be on December 7th, okay? So next Friday, no quiz. Remember, this will be the first quiz we go on Tuesday. And so that, that's Tuesday at 12, okay? Lunchtime, 12, 12 o'clock until 12.10, quiz number six. The week after that, December 14th, it's gonna be the final, okay? Let me write this somewhere. Okay? <clears throat> December 7th, 12 o'clock, quiz number six, all right? Don't forget. December 14th, exam, 12, okay? Other than that, watch the lectures and there'll be, a, there'll be an exam after we do quiz number six. Um, that lecture will be the review, okay? Uh, and then the exam the following week, that will be in in the building, I believe it's gonna be on the first floor, maybe room 124, but that information will be posted too, okay? That's it. Um, like I said, I'm gonna curve up the quiz, so when you get your score released, remember, maximum 10, your score has a maximum of 10, but at plus two on my Excel um, spreadsheet, I'm just gonna add two to everybody's score. It's an easy thing to do with a formula, so. Uh, I'll curve it up by two points, okay? And that'll level things out. Um, I'll make sure that all the content from six is from the, this lecture forward. Thank you for listening and uh, have a good weekend. See you on Tuesday.